This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. With so much going on in life, sometimes we put ourselves last and that can take its toll. Visit betterhelp.com super and make your happiness a priority. Hey brother. Guys, throughout the years, we have created literally hundreds of videos covering the wonderful wizarding world of Harry Potter. We have had speculative theories about topics that are still yet to come and we have been proven right before and proven wrong before at times by the author herself. And like with anything, sometimes half the fun is just simply the anticipation of waiting to determine whether or not we are correct. Taking the old information, we've applied it to the new information. We're trying to piece together what the picture will ultimately look like. But as is the case with anything, as we receive new information, we are now forced to revisit old topics to see how well they still hold up over time. And let me tell you what, when they do, it feels good. So today we are counting down our top five favorite theories that are not only fun, but have stood the test of time. Let's dive on in. Hey brother! Guys, before we dive on into today's video, I'm so excited to announce we have just launched the latest of our common room candle series over at carlinbrotherscoffee.com. The scent on this one is amazing. Just imagine yourself in like the tallest tower in a castle and there's just a gentle, cool, refreshing breeze coming through the open window. Also back in stock now is the Emergency Slab of Chocolate, which is a raspberry chocolate bar that I have to tell you is my absolute favorite. Since these have been out of stock last time, my wife has been asking me over and over again when we will have them back. They are now available. This common room candle might be the most anticipated one so far. If you'd like to check it out, carlinbrotherscoffee.com, link in the description down below. Okay guys, let's just go ahead and dive right on in with number five, Luna Lovegood is a wolf, or at least will be. Let me explain. One of our proudest moments as a channel was when we correctly predicted the fact that Voldemort's snake, Nagini, was actually a woman before she ultimately turned into a snake. Specifically, this woman who is played by Claudia Kim in The Crimes of Grindelwald. This discovery was fascinating, not only because it gave us a little bit of extra backstory to an otherwise rather mysterious character, but it also introduced the blood curse known as a malediction. This affliction only affects women, and what it does is turn you into an animal permanently. But unlike an animagus, this is not something that is happening by choice. It is a slow and forced conversion into the animal, in this case, a giant snake. But what was really fun about this is that it gave us a new lens to examine older characters that we already know and love. Is it possible that anyone else that we already know is headed towards a similar fate? And as it turns out, one of our most beloved characters of all time almost certainly is. Luna Lovegood. Luna is of course delightfully quirky and also the character who I would imagine being the most just simply at peace with the idea of slowly converting into a beast or in this case, a wolf. And on that note, it is worth noting that I do specifically mean wolf and not werewolf because those are two completely different afflictions. That said, what makes this idea just so believable is the overwhelming amount of evidence that you can find that supports it. First of all, in addition to the fact that Luna might just be someone who would be okay with this ultimate conversion, we also know that the person who she ends up marrying may be uniquely equipped to also handle it. Which before we get into that, I gotta tell you, I am a little bit of a Neville stan. I think it's one of the things that the movies got right. However, in the canon, her future husband is none other than the grandson of the man who wrote the book on beasts himself. Rolf Scamander. So just like immediately out of the gate, we'll just take the name Rolf and see what that means. And sure enough, it's Wolf. And it's like, oh, that's kind of adorable. Luna, moon, Rolf, wolf, wolves howl at the moon. Adorable. But it also doesn't just stop there because these two go on to have twin boys of their own by the names of Lysander and Lorcan. Truly unique names would expect nothing else from the daughter of Xenophilius Lovegood. But beyond being unique names, there's something very interesting that happens when you kind of mesh them together. If you take the lie from Lysander and the can from Lorcan, you end up with Lycan aka the ability or power of a human being to turn into, wait for it, a wolf. Do you see what I mean? Stuff just keeps piling up. But if you're still not convinced, there's more. Because we even have some evidence to suggest that Luna's own mother suffered from the same affliction. We know that Luna witnessed her mother's death because we know that she can also see Thestrals. And we ultimately learned that her mother's death was caused by one of her own experiments backfiring. 
Now, there is no cure for a malediction, but kind of given the Lovegood's reputation and their approach to magic, it would not surprise me at all if the experiment that her mother was performing was an attempt to cure this very thing, either for herself or for her daughter. While this is obviously extremely sad, Luna does have the unique ability to maintain a sunny disposition towards this type of thing. Yes, it was rather horrible. I still feel very sad about it sometimes, but I've still got dad. And anyway, it's not as though I'll never see mom again, is it? This helps me believe that Luna would just embrace this change with open arms. Guys, we now need to take a brief pause to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Guys, summer is right around the corner. And if you haven't looked into Bespoke Post already, I have to recommend it because it is packed with so many cool summer goodies. I am personally a huge fan of Bespoke Post. I have been a subscriber long before they were a sponsor of this channel. And it's because each month they come out with so many cool things that you can pick up. There are a bunch of boxes that are currently catching my eye, but one in particular is the Julep box, which comes with everything you need to make an awesome cocktail. The other one though is the grow box, which I think would be amazing to grow mint that you could then use in those juleps. Another great one that I actually got last summer that I use all the time is from the chill box, which is just a really, really nice, good looking portable cooler. But like I said, they release new boxes every single month across a huge variety of categories. So there really is almost something for everyone. It also makes a really good Father's Day present. It is totally free to sign up and you can skip or cancel at any time. And you can get 20% off your first box when you head on over to boxofawesome.com and use promo code super at checkout. Again, it's gonna be boxofawesome.com, promo code super at checkout for 20% off. One last time, boxofawesome.com, promo code super, link is in the description down below. Anyway, guys, let's now move on to plausible theory number four. Hagrid, or should I say Swagrid, is completely wealthy. <laughs> We all know that Hagrid was forced out of his educational career in his third year when he is framed for the death of Mooning Myrtle by Tom Riddle. And we know that this event took place in the year of 1942 because what actually happened was Tom Riddle had opened the Chamber of Secrets, an event that we know doesn't happen again until Harry arrives in his second year, 1992, where it is again reopened. While this did cut Hagrid's education short, it did provide him with a lot of time for what people over in the world of finance might call compounding interest, or in layman's terms, Lots of galleons. I don't actually know how wizard banks or investing works, but if it's anything like the rest of their financial system, it is straight up bonkers. And by bonkers, I do mean complete nonsense. The point is, is that by the time Harry arrives at Hogwarts, Hagrid has been working as the gamekeeper for nearly 50 years and lives a lifestyle that doesn't exactly suggest he has many expenses. He lives on Hogwarts grounds, which as far as I can tell would mean that he doesn't have any rent due to the school. All of his meals are provided by the school. And near as I can tell, this is a list of all of his possessions. A single half giant moleskin coat, which Harry described as mostly pockets, an uglier coat, an even uglier tie, chipped dishware, some tankards, a bed, a quilt, a crossbow, some boots, definitely not an umbrella and a barrel because he got to have a good barrel. Am I right? Not to mention, he seems to have unique access to extremely valuable materials that come from Fantastic Beasts, including unicorn hairs and acrobantula venom, which apparently go for 10 galleons a piece and 100 galleons a pint, according to Slughorn. Now, we obviously don't know what his exact salary in fact is, but we do know that after 50 years, it's going to probably start to add up a little bit. And on top of that, it seems like Dumbledore is pretty generous. Our best frame of reference for what somebody who works at Hogwarts might be paid actually comes thanks to, of all people, Dobby. He is of course the first ever paid house elf at Hogwarts and tells us, Professor Dumbledore offered Dobby 10 galleons a week and weekends off. Now it's kind of hard to tell here whether or not Dumbledore is just offering the same standard fare that any other employee of Hogwarts might receive, or if this could even be a little bit on the low side considering the fact that most house elves all house elves are not paid. Either way though, that's a house elf and Hagrid has been working here for 50 plus years and Dumbledore trusts him with his life. So I'm thinking at bare minimum, he makes a little bit more than Dobby. That's pre Dobby talking his salary down, which ultimately goes down to one galleon. I think Hagrid makes a lot more than that. Either way, point is at least 10 galleons, very likely more when you consider just, you know, annual raises, inflation, all that type of stuff. But either way, 10 galleons a week, that's 40 galleons a month, 480 galleons a year, and 24,000 galleons over the course of 50 years. 
dollars. Just an FYI, the price of gold per ounce as of today is one thousand eight hundred and thirty eight dollars and twenty nine cents. So, you know, math, math, math in US dollars. If a galleon is just one ounce of gold, which I have a feeling it's more than that. But if it is just one ounce, that would equate to forty four million one hundred and eighteen thousand nine hundred and sixty dollars minimum. And the price of gold today is like low compared to like last month. Either which way, I can't claim to know how wizarding money might be converted into, you know, our currency. That being said though, you know who's not particularly stumped about conversions within wizarding currency? Hagrid. The gold ones are galleons. 17 silver sickles to a galleon and 29 knuts to a sickle. It's easy enough. Yeah, can't spell Voldemort. No, I can't spell it. But calls multiples of 17 and 29 easy. 17 and 29 are both prime numbers. That's as low as they go. Quick, what's 17 times seven? If you took longer than this to answer, it's too hard. Quick, what's 10 times seven? Yeah, see, told you, told you. I'm making points left and right over here. What I'm trying to say though, is that Hagrid just knows a lot about the things he knows a lot about. Beasts and coins. <laughs> Of those coins, we also see him spend very generously for one Harry Potter on beasts. Most notably on Harry's 11th birthday, you know, kind of the day they formally meet each other truly for the first time, when Hagrid buys him an owl. And not just any owl, it's a snowy owl. Remember the last time you met somebody, you know, for the first time that day and then went out and bought him an exotic animal? Me neither! Either way, Hedwig is a snowy owl and absolutely seems to stand out as very unique amongst the parliament of owls that exist at Hogwarts. You see that? I totally slipped in parliament of owls as if that's just a totally common thing to say, but it is in fact the correct term for group of owls. Either way, no matter what, it must be rare enough that Harry is the only kid with a white owl. Even Malfoy is sporting common brown. <laughs> Embarrassing. <laughs> But beyond the most baller owl of all time, he also gives Harry a fanged wallet, you know, for keeping your riches safe, and a mokeskin pouch, which he himself describes as being very rare. And what is it used for? Storing precious objects that only the owner can retrieve. We get it, Hagrid, you've got stuff other people want. Anyway, I must move on or else I will continue to make bad jokes. Moving on to believable theory at number three, Filch is a poltergeist. Filch's existence within the magical wizarding world has absolutely never made sense to me until it did and then it made perfect sense. First of all, you have a caretaker inside of a school of magic where every single person present is capable of doing magic and he is capable of not doing magic. Capable of not doing magic feels like the wrong way to say that. He's not capable of magic. Either way, it is flat out unfair. How on earth is he supposed to be able to perform this job. Before we said that Dumbledore, you know, was, was generous, but the day that he hired Filch, I think he was just being mean. But that's just the thing. I don't think that he hired him at all. I think he's just part of the castle. Filch has exactly one objective, and that is to stop mischief. Mischief that is of course caused in part by the many students that attend the school, but also by his arch nemesis, Peeves. We know that Peeves is a poltergeist. This is just flat out told to us. And it's important to explain that poltergeists are different from ghosts. They're not like remnants of a formerly living person. Instead, they are manifestations of a very specific form of energy that exists inside of a space. And in the case of Peeves, he is the embodiment of all of the mischievous and rule-breaking behavior of the students in the castle, and as such is a semi-living entity that 100% embodies that very ideal. But if there were no students present in the castle at all, then there would be no mischief, and with no mischief, there could be no peeves. So I kind of feel like he may have taken a little bit of a hit the day Fred and George left the castle. However, if you want to use Fred and George as an example of rule breaking, we can also look for their polar opposite, which happens to be their older brother, Percy. I happen to be a school prefect. Percy is of course the rule abiding to a fault prefect head boy, keep up! And I bring up this exact contrast because I actually think we can apply it to poltergeists. If rule breaking manifests as peeves, then what is the exact opposite of that? Rule following. And who is the exact opposite of peeves, if not his arch nemesis, Filch. Filch just isn't an actual true staff member of the castle, which I also think is probably why the other staff members don't always treat him that nicely. They are supposed to be out of bed, you blithering idiot. 
Oh. This also sort of explains why he can't do magic because magic on its own sort of breaks the rules. Filch isn't supposed to be good or bad at his job because he wasn't actually hired to do a job. He just sort of exists. Also might explain why he never has to sleep. Why is this guy always up in the middle of the night? and during the day. But while we discuss magic, that doesn't always seem to make sense, let's move on to another Hogwarts magical artifact, the Sorting Hat. The Sorting Hat is as mysterious as it is simple. It doesn't really have a tremendous role that it's playing at the school on an annual basis, but it does contain the knowledge of the four founders of the school. It also has the unique ability to transport physical objects via itself, as long as they come in the shape of a sword previously owned by Godric Gryffindor. Awfully convenient. But the mysterious thing about the Sorting Hat has less to do with what it is capable of doing and more to do with the fact that nobody seems to know that it exists, at least until they do. Isn't that just always the way? I never knew that thing existed, so it didn't, but now I do and now it does. Bader Meinhof is the thing you're trying to think of right now. You learn something new and then you see it everywhere. But let me explain more because I'm not 100% sure this is immediately obvious. Ron, for example, comes from a very long line of pure-blooded wizards and eight members of his family before him have attended Hogwarts if you count Molly and Arthur. Despite this fact, Ron does not know how the sorting works. He says the following to Harry. Some sort of test, I think. Fred said it hurts a lot, but I think he was joking. To be fair, Ron doesn't necessarily always know the things, but in the first book, that's definitely his role, to be Harry's liaison to the wizarding world. Either way, the person who does seem to know everything doesn't come from a pure blood background is in fact, Hermione Granger. She also doesn't know how it works. No one was talking much except for Hermione Granger, who was whispering very fast about the spells she learned and wondering which one she'd need. This is kind of ironic when the next thing that we hear her say is, it's bewitched to look like the sky. I read about it in Hogwarts, a history. Do you mean to tell me that Hogwarts, a history, does not mention the sorting hat, the artifact that spawns from the literal start of the school of Hogwarts. There is nothing more history than the Sorting Hat. So how could this be? And I believe the answer is that the knowledge of the Sorting Hat is actually protected by the Fidelius Charm. If you'll recall, the Fidelius Charm is an ancient and powerful spell that allows you to store specific information inside of one person. It's this exact thing that the members of the Order of the Phoenix are using to hide in Grimwald Place. From there, the only person who can reveal this particular piece of information is the Secret Keeper themselves. Unless, of course, that person dies, in which case anybody who has been told the secret by the Secret Keeper now becomes a Secret Keeper. Again, if we're to use Grimwald Place as an example, this is what made the location so much less safe after Dumbledore's death. He was the secret keeper. Once he died, every member of the order now knew the location of Grimwald Place, including Snape. The question that then of course arises is, if this is the case, then who was the original secret keeper about the sorting hat that after centuries of existence, it's still in effect? And the answer is that the hat is its own secret keeper. Thus, only the hat can tell others about itself. Once he does, everyone who knows the secret is then able to discuss it amongst themselves, but not to people who don't know the secret yet. In fact, even when McGonagall is telling the first years about the sorting ceremony in Harry's first year, she doesn't actually say anything. Just simply that they are about to be sorted, not how. She places a hat on the stool and then the hat itself tells them. In song form. Aha, but then if you are eagle-eyed, I bet you're wondering, well, what about in the epilogue when Albus is talking to Harry? The answer here is that I think at the end, when Voldemort lights the hat on fire when it's on Neville's head, he effectively kills the hat. They obviously go on to fix it, of course, but in doing so, what he did was allow everybody who already had knowledge of the hat to now become secret keepers. Wait a Ruin a fun tradition, Voldemort. <laughs> on that note though, let's move on to our final most plausible theory. The Sword of Gryffindor was originally intended to be the final Horcrux. Here's the really simple version of it. We know that Voldemort was tracking down artifacts from the founders of Hogwarts, and he has already found the other three, including the lost diadem of Ravenclaw. Yeah. You think he stopped there? We also know that Dumbledore tells Harry that he was sure that Voldemort was going to use his death Harry's death as a baby to make the final Horcrux. He seems to have reserved the process of making Horcruxes for particularly significant deaths. 
You would certainly have been that. He believed that in killing you, he was destroying the danger the prophecy had outlined. He believed he was making himself invincible. I am sure that he was intending to make his final Horcrux with your death. So whatever he was planning on turning into a Horcrux, he had with him that night. And yet, whatever it was, was obviously ultimately missing from the wreckage of the Potter household. So I might ask you, is there a known object of Godric Gryffindor that has a reputation for having the ability to disappear? Well, by golly, there sure is. The sword! And that information is indeed somewhat well known to the greater wizarding world. Scrimgeour says to Harry, according to reliable historical sources, the sword may present itself to any worthy Gryffindor. So I'm sure that Voldemort, who was very good at unlocking magical secrets, was aware of this particular bit of information. In fact, we even know some worthy Gryffindors that may have been worthy of being presented with the sword prior to their deaths. Fabian and Gideon Pruitt. Mad-Eye tells Harry, Gideon Pruitt took five Death Eaters to kill him and his brother Fabian. They fought like heroes. Fun fact, those two are Molly Weasley's brothers. So yeah, I think we can pretty reliably trust the idea that they were Gryffindors. Also, also fun fact, the G and F, Fred and George. Lastly, the need to collect the sword explains one other big question that was always left unanswered for a long time. Why did it take Voldemort so long to ultimately attack the Potters? Around Harry's birthday in July, Lily explains in her letter to Sirius that James is tired of being cooped up, meaning they were already in hiding in July. And we also know that during this time, Wormtail is able to visit the house. Lily even says that he seemed a little bit off, and yet Voldemort still doesn't attack until Halloween, three months later. Seriously, why the wait? What are you waiting for? The ability to go down the street and appear to be in costume? There actually is a line where a kid says, nice costume, mister. So can't rule that out. My explanation, he needed the sword. He got it, he brought it to the Potters and blew himself up. After which the sword disappeared from the wreckage, not to be found again until 1992 when Harry was in the Chamber of Secrets with Tom Riddle. But there you go, guys. Those are going to be our top five most airtight Harry Potter theories. Let us know what do you think? Do they hold up to the test? Let us know in the towel section down below. As ever, guys, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like the video if you haven't already and subscribe. If you'd like to check out any of the topics we just covered, we do have complete videos on all of them right over here. Otherwise, until next time, bye.